Jonathan Dober, and I am just delighted to be here and conversation uh, with Frederick Branfen about his new book, which is Intimate Strangers, A History of Jews and Catholics in the City of Rome. Uh, I told Fred in the beginning that I would review his credentials, his bona fides, except once I did that, we'd have no time to talk about the book. He is an attorney, an archeologist, uh, a philosopher. Uh, he has done more in a lifetime than any five people I know, and I know a lot of people in groups of five. This book is fascinating. It has, most books are interesting in inverse proportion to the amount that they are footnoted. This is a book of history, beautifully sourced and documented with 80 pages of index and footnotes at the end, not disruptive in the middle, but written with style, with humor, with irony, with interest. It's just a wonderful, wonderful book about the story of Rome and the Jewish people and how we are, in fact, intimate strangers. I want to start, although I'll certainly get to the topics, the broad topics of assimilation and banishment, of race versus religion, of Jewish guilt uh, in terms of the deicide, the killing of, for Christians, Christ, for Jews, Jesus, or the, are Jews the killers or the deliverers, the handmaidens of salvation? We'll also obviously get to both uh, fascist anti-Semitism, uh, modern anti-Semitism, and the controversies over several of the popes, in particular, of course, the role of Pope Pius XII uh, during World War II and the Shoah. But I want to begin with what I found to be an interesting, ironic tidbit uh, in the first third of the book almost a throwaway line that I think shows the Jewish attitude of irony, but not denying reality, uh, and ask you, Fred, to talk a little bit about how the Roman ghetto was called by much of the Jewish population at the time, the get, and get was not short for ghetto. It meant something else entirely. And uh, Fred, welcome, and would you expand on that? Yeah, I'd be happy to, and thank you so much for having me, and thank you, of course, for the lovely and gracious introduction. Uh, let me say that uh, the Roman ghetto was founded 1555, um, but it wasn't the first ghetto in Italy. The first ghetto in Italy was founded in around 1514 in Venice. And it was called a ghetto, and we're not quite certain why it was known as a ghetto, ghetto being an Italian word. It's an Italian word. It seems to have something to do with the metal slag that uh, the area of the ghetto had been used uh, to house. Uh, Jews in Venice were put on an island separate from everybody else, and uh, the island had, used to, had, had been used uh, for uh, waste metals and slag. And it seems as if the word stuck that it was called the ghetto. And people in Italy knew about the, the Venice ghetto when the Roman ghetto was established. Um, but the Jews at Rome uh, conceived of their relationship to their uh, confinement and their relationship to the church in a totally different way. Uh, they didn't conceive of themselves as castoffs, uh, throwaways, metal slag, they conceived of their relationship with uh, the papacy and the Vatican as uh, something like uh, a family relationship, a uh, marriage relationship even. Um, and they um, talked about themselves being enclosed, first off, in a seraglio. We're, we're, we're parts of the Pope's harem now. The Pope has just as you know, a, 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 uh, an Oriental monarch keeps a harem enclosed 
and keeps them uh, out of touch with the world. We have been enclosed in a, in a seraglio in order to uh, keep keep us as the uh, the wives of the Pope. This, of course, is a joke. And but then, because of course they knew about the ghetto in Venice, they went on to say at a certain point uh, that the Pope has given us a get. The Pope has divorced us. The get is a bill of divorcement in Jewish legal law, uh, legal custom. Uh, a man can divorce his wife by giving her a get. And so Jews said, the Pope has given us a get. We're now, we used to be his family, and now we're divorced. And that too was a joke. But that's uh, how they, it's not the origin of the word ghetto, it's how they use the word ghetto to make fun of their situation. It's a very elegant pun. Yeah, yeah, yes. Well, let me go back to the beginning, uh, having shown the irony of and cleverness of the Jewish population at that time. Uh, and you bookend the book uh, with the story of the uh, Arch of Titus, beginning with uh, humiliation and ending with a kind of second march thousands of years later that redeems and reclaims it. Could you tell us about that? Yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, so the Arch of Titus was built by his brother to uh, glorify Titus and his deification because of the wonderful things he did, according to his brother, one of which was to destroy the uh, temple in Jerusalem and put down the Jewish revolt uh, in Judea. And uh, Titus was very proud of this, and his brother was very proud. And they built this enormous arch uh, upon his death, which uh, on the interior of the arch uh, has depictions of the destruction of Jerusalem and also the carrying of the temple treasures from the temple through the streets of Rome, including the, um, uh, the temple menorah. And at the very top of the roof of the arch, there is a picture of Titus ascending to heaven uh, to be uh, deified along with Julius Caesar and Augustus, whatever. Um, and this, of course, was uh, considered by uh, Jews who already lived in Rome and for generations later to be uh, a, a true humiliation. Uh, it, was, uh, it was during Roman times considered to be you know, a glorification of Rome. And then during Christian times, it was also uh, an indication to Catholics that look, see Jerusalem uh, was destroyed by the Romans because the Jews have been superseded by Catholics. And uh, this was all predicted by Jesus. And all of this is also in the Arch of Titus. So the Arch of Titus was a scene of embarrassment and humiliation until uh, December 7th, I think it was 1947, maybe it was December 3rd, 1947, when the United Nations established the state of Israel, the Jewish population of Rome apparently spontaneously arrived at the Arch of Titus, a place which they had always found to be upsetting. And there, uh, the chief rabbi of Rome and Jews from all over Rome and some who were just traveling through Rome, some who lived there, uh, sang songs, said prayers, uh, and were uh, joyously celebrating the establishment of the state of Israel. And then, somehow or other, spontaneously, what they did was they they marched in the opposite direction through the arch. If you were marching from Jerusalem to Rome as a slave at that time, you would be going from east to west. The Jewish population uh, on the 7th, uh, in 1947, walked the other way. They marched and danced the other way as if to unspool and to undo 2,000 years of history. And uh, 
when I heard about that, of course, had to put that in my book. Uh, and what is not in my book, as I'd learned about it later, was that the mayor of Rome uh, very recently uh, went to the Arch of Titus, and the mayor of Rome said, this arch now is a tribute to the Jewish people. It used to be a tribute to the Romans. It is no longer. It is a tribute to the Jewish people and their perseverance. And I find that amazing too. And the uh, reuse, the ironic reuse of uh, memorials, well, I think is, is just amazing. But yeah, that's what it is. And that's that that's that's a wonderful story. Uh, do you uh, care to uh, tie in Berenice in the uh, in the first uh, uh, in incident of the Gulf of the uh, Arch of uh, Titus? Well, the equivalent a... relationship that Jews and Italians, Romans had even then. Well, you know, Berenice was a queen of Judea uh, at, during the time during the first century. Uh, CE. And she had something of a checkered past. She, I think, was married twice before the Roman, uh, before the Judean revolt. And when Titus put an end to the Jewish revolt, and she warned the Jewish people, she and her brother Agrippa warned the Jewish people, this revolt will not succeed. Nevertheless, the revolt proceeded. It was put down she presented herself to Titus, and uh, she basically became his mistress, his concubine, whatever it was. And he was quite taken with her, and he brought her back to Rome with him. Um, and he was fully prepared to marry this Jewish queen uh, and rule the Roman Empire with her. There were voices, uh, say, <laughs> who were, uh, were against this. And, and the voices were heard loud and clear. Uh, because, of course, uh, uh, the upshot of a Jewish queen in Rome, uh, a Jewish empress in Rome, would be ultimately Jewish emperors uh, their from their children. And uh, that could not be. And so her story is that uh, either sadly or not, uh, Titus had to send her back, had to exile her back to Judea. And uh, she was not really heard, heard from uh, much again. And this is done at this point, as I understand it, this is really done uh, in polytheistic Rome. Christianity has not yet been adopted in Christianity in the form that we understand it, obviously post-Nicene uh, in around 320 CE uh, didn't exist. Yes, and this was, this was I mean, uh, Jew, Jews were uh, a well-known commodity in Rome during this time period. And despite the fact that there was a Judean revolt, which had to be put down by an army of Romans, Jews in Rome did not suffer because of, of what their brethren were doing in Judea. Somewhat amazingly, but, the, but, they, but they didn't. But the, the, the uh, Roman religion at the time was really a religion which, which deified many of the emperors. And yes, you could believe, I guess, in you know, the um, the gods it could be uh, Jupiter or whoever, but really the, the, the god that the Roman emperors wanted you to believe in was them. Uh, you know, what, what, what your thoughts on, on Jupiter? They didn't really care. But to say that their brother was not a god, that was atheism. And that was considered uh, uh, punishable. So under what what theory did the anti-Semitism that got bad enough for Rome to talk about banishing Jews to Sardinia, hoping that they would uh, go away and die there, which immediately struck me as a precursor of Hitler 
wanting to send Jews to Madagascar. Uh, under what rationale did that kind of anti-Semitic xenophobia arise? We, you know, I don't think it's very clear. I think that you're right to compare it somewhat to Hitler, because although it is not entirely clear what Jews were doing, that I mean, they were requiring uh, this uh, theory, sending them to, uh, to Sardinia, it was thought that they were infectious, that Jews were infectious like a disease of some sort. Probably they were, and they were, they were converting people to Judaism. And they were people who were, uh, of course, uh, God-fearers, that is to say that they did not fully convert to Judaism, many because it was not clear what that meant to go from one religion to another. But people knew that they liked what Jews talked about. And among some people, this was um, spreading. It was infectious, as uh, the word that they use. And they wanted uh, Jews to be expelled and, uh, you know, taken as far away as possible, which for the, then was Sardinia. <laughs> it wasn't that far, but, and uh, to, to cauterize the infection. It never happened, you know, because, because these, are, these were factions of people who uh, felt this way, but it was never a uh, full blown uh, policy of any Roman government. Uh, Anti-Semitism, in the sense that we understand it, uh, preceding the Christianization, official Christianization uh, of Rome, at some point uh, when Rome is Christianized, and again, it's pre-Nicaea, hmm. uh, you get language about uh, Jews uh, being covered from the Articles of Salvation and their very existence being a denial of the truth of what is really almost primitive Christianity. Yes, but uh, as far as I know, um, there, was, there was that, but the, the atmosphere in Rome at that time was metropolitan. And yes, uh, there, there, there was, uh, of course, we know that in the Roman Empire, in the Roman Empire, there was virulent anti-Semitism uh, coming out of um, Antioch, Damascus, places like that. Um, but Rome itself had less uh, theological anti-Semitism that I'm fully aware of. Yes. Well, do you see that? before uh, Constantine and before uh, Nicaea? Or it, I, I guess I'm asking about at what point is, it's, is Rome Christianized enough for the anti-Semitism to shift from a race of foreigners uh, to a religion and a denial of the salvation story of the Christians? Well, I think that when you get to uh, Augustine, and Ambrose, Saint, the, the, the two of them, and they have an argument. What do we do with the Jews? What do we do with the Jews? Because they are a denial of salvation. They are uh, themselves. They are so wayward, so wrong in their beliefs uh, that uh, they are they are uh, deserving opprobrium. And then you have the what I believe was the argument between Ambrose. Ambrose just wanted uh, Jews to be uh, eliminated as much as possible, get rid of them, um, burn their synagogues. It's okay if you do that. Uh, he was a person who felt that there was no good, no good could come from living next door to a Jew. Augustine, on the other hand, although he believed that uh, Jewish beliefs were thoroughly wrong, believed that the presence of Jews was an example to people of what you could become if you did not believe in the salvation of Christ. That this, that uh, in order to understand 
the full range of salvation and uh, damnation to a certain extent, you had to have Jews in your midst. And I think these, this, these are the two positions that I'm familiar with. Well, it, and it's and there's always this tension, both in your book and in modern history with conversion and the uh, lack of permanency, even of conversion, about whether they are seeing Jews as a race of people and subject to racial xenophobia or deniers uh, or religion uh, that denies their salvation story which is to deny them the articles of salvation, which they in turn deny Jews. Yeah, well, uh, the for me, uh, there was a third uh, attitude towards Jews, which is more modern, and it's racial in a sense, but what it believes is, uh, what is that uh, Jews are themselves manipulators of uh, the world. They are either, they can be, they, they can be because of their beliefs or they can believe, be, or be, they can be because of their race, but whatever they are, they are behind in the scenes manipulators, which are causing misery to everyone. And this goes back, of course, to doesn't matter whether uh, you believe that Judaism is a faulty belief system or Judaism is a race, if you believe that Jews are poisoning wells and are, and are creating plagues, that is the, to me, the fulcrum around a great deal of, around which a great deal of hatred revolves. And their existence is a criticism and an infection. The, the idea of Judaizing and seeking converts apparently both in pre-Christian Rome and certainly in Christian times becomes uh, a, a death penalty case. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That, that's for sure. Uh, but there was a time apparently, and I'm, I've only read about this, but in, in Rome, in pre-Christian Rome, uh, uh, especially when the understanding that you could change your religion, that you could make a decision and change your religion was a difficult concept to elaborate on, to say, well, he's converted. Well, what does that mean that he's converted or she converted? And of course, the person who has converted pretty much knows what it means. But from, from the outside, is that a possible uh, transformation or not? And th these were issues, I think, that uh, you know we may take for granted that you can convert or not convert, but the very idea of conversion was not uh, not fully understood for some. Well, it gets pretty elegant in one story that you tell about uh, in order to get a Jewish child converted, you needed a father, and it turns out that the woman, the mother, can in fact, for legal reasons, be can be called and recognized as the father in order for the father to authorize the conversion of a Jewish baby. Yes, well, this is in the 1700s already, and this was at a time when the Catholic Church was doing somersaults and uh, and contortions in order to uh, achieve conversions of Jewish children or Jews. Uh, in particular, um, the instance you're talking about is that a person who has converted him or her, he or she has converted to Catholicism and has been baptized. So now we're in the 1700s and everybody knows you're baptized, you're no longer a Jew, you are converted, at least according to the Catholic Church. Um, this person then, this converted uh, Jew, then has the right to donate his or her offspring to the church, despite the fact that they uh, may not want to be converted to Christianity, they can donate their offspring. And the question then becomes, who can do the donation? Well, it's, uh, you know, uh, the, the father has to donate. But what if the father doesn't want to donate? Well, the Catholic Church says, well, then, uh, in this situation, if the, uh, if the, uh, 
uh, if the mother wants to make her child uh, a Christian like herself, uh, not to allow that would be an insult to the church. And in cases where the church could be insulted in such a manner, we can make the exception and the woman can become a man for that purpose and she can donate her children. This is, you know, uh, people used to say, you know, angels dancing on the head of a pen or whatever it is. This is a contortion, but it was done at, to, to the extent I'm sure which, uh, you know, which, which a grandmother could donate her daughter who is not converted, daughter, Jewish daughter, her daughter's unborn children to the church. And uh, everyone had to take a deep breath <laughs> when that was going to be decided by the Catholic uh, authorities. Could a, could a grandmother donate her unborn children, unborn grandchildren to the church? It never uh, became a, a viable problem <clears throat> very often because the mother donated them anyway, so it didn't matter. So with conversion, I'm, I'm fascinated just over history. Yeah. Uh, when conversion is sought by uh, various Christian institutions, but then the conversion itself, while not theologically reversible, comes under suspicion and that you're not a real Christian or your Christianity is suspect. You have a statistic of 43 percent uh, intermarriage at one point. Uh, there was close to 50 percent of Vienna in the 19th, 20th century uh, with the Jewish population uh, converted about half to Protestantism, half to Catholicism. There were Jewish converts during the Inquisition, particularly in Spain, and the conversions were often called into question and not recognized even though they couldn't go back again. Yeah, well, the interesting thing for me is uh, what happens at the time of uh, the uh, expulsion of the Jews from uh, from Spain. And many Jews had converted to uh, Catholicism, were forcibly converted, and now they and their families were uh, their families were expelled, and they took flight also from Spain and came to Rome. The reason they came to Rome is because uh, in those days, Sicily, which is now, of course, part of Italy, Sicily was a part of Spain. So when the Jews were expelled from Spain, they were expelled from Sicily. And they found their way very quickly to the gates of Rome. And the Jewish community was, to some extent, uh, concerned that a bunch of Jews, some of whom were Christians or part Christians or whatever it was, and had, had converted, were going to enter the city of Rome and then reconvert back to Judaism and place all of the, the Jewish uh, uh, community in Rome under suspicion as it, it could be accused, they could be accused of Roman Jews be accused of converting these uh, Christians back to Judaism, ma making that effort. And they were very much against uh, Jews entering the city of Rome, even though they'd been exiled from Spain. The Pope, however, had no concerns <laughs> and the Pope let them in. And uh, they became part of the Jewish community of Rome. There is a Sicilian and there was a Sicilian synagogue uh, in Rome uh, at the time, uh, and a lot of the fears were simply unfounded. Well, let me jump ahead a little bit because we're going to get to questions, and I know that these will come up, but let's let's get a head start on it. Uh, when the fascists begin to uh, to influence and to take over uh, Rome, when uh, when Mussolini, who was originally called an eater of priests, uh, decides that the church is uh, a good tool for him to use. There was a phrase that, that hit me in the kishkas, mm -hmm. and that was one of the popes uh, saying, we don't have any special plans, I'm sorry, Mussolini, any special plans 
to persecute the Jews, but we are against blood and race and race mixing. Uh, yes. It seemed to imply plans, but not it, almost like Putin's special operation. Well, plans, if you're talking about Mussolini, yeah. plans were uh, always changeable. Instead of Mussolini, he had no policy. He had rhetoric. And uh, when the rhetoric suited him, he could be a vicious racist. And when the rhetoric, rhetoric suited him, he could declare that he was a Zionist. Uh, so he was uh, you know, a person who uh, was basically interested in his own self-preservation and self-aggrandizement. Um, and really, it was not until 1938 when he finally took a breath and decided, I'm a racist. <laughs> and before that, he would say he was not a racist. And there was no racism in, in Italy. Uh, they did, you know, there's no racism in Italy. Now, Jews are a very small minority in Italy, and they should not hold uh, a percentage of the uh, positions of power or of any kind of position greater than their percentage. And since their percentage is less than 1%, that meant that Jews could not hold 1% uh, of you know, positions in the army, in the hospitals, whatever it was. But they, that was not racism, according to him. Finally, in 1938, he declared, yes, I am a racist. And he, in fact, uh, wanted the Italian people to become racist and to become more racist uh, than uh, he thought uh, they would be. And this uh, became the basis of the racial laws, which were uh, vicious and prevented Jews from living any sort of normal life in Italy with the hope, of course, that they would uh, emigrate. Yeah, the, the, the scope of persecution and deportation uh, was obviously uh, shocking because we tend to have a different picture of Italians in uh, in our more in our hearts than in our heads than we than we do of Germans. Uh, mm -hmm. at, but the extent of, of persecution during the Shoah is 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 pretty extraordinary. But let let's get to the subject before we go to the uh, viewers' questions of the role of the various popes uh, mm -hmm. in terms of protecting or denouncing and the various rationales for their behavior and or passivity uh, towards the persecution of Jews in the 20th century? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll go to Pope Pius XII because he's at the heart of the matter. His predecessor, there's also, there are all sorts of uh, discussions about a secret encyclical that was going to uh, be anti-racist or whatever it was. But if we get to Pius XII, he begins his, uh, his uh, uh, you know, his papacy, in 1939, um, and Pope Pius XII uh, was considered by his colleagues and by uh, other people in the church to be a very, very spiritual man. He did a lot of praying, is what we were told, uh, and he, uh, he had the image, if you saw him, of a person who was consumed by his own spirituality. Uh, in his relationship to uh, the Holocaust and to um, the German authorities, the Pope does not exactly live up to that image of spirituality. And he was made statement after statement after statement deploring the suffering of innocent people throughout Europe at that time. But he could never, ever utter the word Jew in that regard. He couldn't say the sufferings of Jewish people, the sufferings of Jewish children, never. What he said uh, repeatedly was that innocence, innocent people, innocents, uh, were suffering, and it made him uh, suffer too. Uh, having said that, I can say that um, this appeared to be a well-thought-out policy on his part. 
this was not uh, this was not something that he was doing haphazardly, I don't think. Well, it appears as if he felt he was walking a tightrope, which he did not want to uh, fall off of. Um, he knew because he had people in the Vatican who were uh, taking refuge from the, Nazi, the Nazis. He knew that Jews were being held in Catholic institutions all over Rome, all over Italy and in Europe. And not only that, but that there were Jewish families in the Vatican who were being kept safe from the Nazis. And there is a thought, maybe it's not true, there's a thought that he felt that should he push Hitler or the Nazis on this issue and make an issue of uh, the persecution of Jewish people and Jewish children, make that an issue publicly, he might be jeopardizing the Jews being, being sheltered in Catholic institutions because he could not prevent Nazis from entering any church in the Third Reich, any church in France or in Poland, Italy or in Rome, and taking people out and killing them, including the 70 families who were living in the Vatican with him. So it is possible that he had this thought. Um, he never said it. We can't find it. And you know, he has extensive writings, letters, whatever it is, nothing, zero. However, I have run across a, uh, a statement by his nuncio to the government, the puppet government of Mussolini. Uh, was, he was established as a puppet in Northern Italy by Hitler uh, after 1943. And uh, Mussolini wanted the Pope to recognize his puppet government, this called the Salo Republic. And the nuncio to the Salo Republic could, could not be ambassador because, uh, because the Pope did not recognize the legitimacy of that puppet government. But the nuncio was addressed by Mussolini's Secretary of State. Please recognize us. Please, um, you know, give us your support. And the nuncio, not the Pope, the nuncio said, well, we must remain neutral. So because if we do not remain neutral in this and in other situations, there could be reprisals against innocent persons. And we are trying to avoid that. And that is the only statement I have ever found of a policy by the church to remain passive, passive on the papal level uh, in order to preserve lives. Now, one, one of our uh, viewers wants to know, in general, what's the current attitude of Romans towards the Jewish citizens of Rome and the general attitude of the Italian population? Okay, well, first of all, the number of Jews living in Italy is tiny. 40,000 Jews in Italy. In Rome, 13,000 Jews in Italy. In general, in general, uh, the attitude is good. It's fine. They're comfortable. They, uh, they, they have no complaints. The governments of, uh, of Italy have been uh, supportive. There was a terrible, terrible terrorist attack um, by Libyans on the uh, synagogue of Rome some years ago. Uh, a uh, five-year-old child was killed. Uh, 
this was not Roman anti-Semitism. This was a terrorist attack. And people, uh, you know, rallied around the Jewish community at that time. Uh, as far as I can tell, the, uh, the population of Rome and of Italy in general is comfortable with its Jewish counterparts and the Jews are comfortable living in Italy. Having and, said that- And Pope Francis is uh, particularly uh, friendly with uh, several of the rabbis? Absolutely, uh, especially the chief rabbi of, uh, of Rome, uh, Ricardo de Segni, and Pope Francis is, is quite interested in good relations with the Jewish community, publicly speaking. So when Pope, Pope Francis goes to the synagogue in Rome, he met with the family of the child who was murdered, met with them personally, met with them separately to express his severe condolences at the death of their child. That sort of public act makes uh, for good relations with uh, the Jewish community. We've uh, got about five minutes left, so let's do the lightning round. Uh, I've had several people ask, can you comment on James Carroll's book on Constantine's sword and how yours might be different? And thank you for a fascinating discussion. Okay, James Carroll's book, the difference between my book and James Carroll's book is that James Carroll's book is much better than my book. James Carroll's book is just a ter terrific book. I loved it. I found it an inspiration for my own writing. Uh, and of course, what it, is, what it is about is he, as a Catholic, uh, takes the church to task for its anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic policies. Uh, he is powerful about it. He is eloquent about it. And believe me, if you haven't read Constantine's Sword, run out and get it. Great book. Uh, there's a question here, and I was going to raise it earlier. Anonymous asks, I've uh, been curious about Rabbi Israel Zoli and his conversion to Catholicism in 1945. Yeah. Uh, what do you think motivated that at the time, briefly? Well, what people say what motivated the time is that he was a he was a convert out of spite. There are two different, I've read his biography, his autobiography, and apparently he was a person who he claims in his autobiography to have been devoted to Christ since he was a child. And he only converted after uh, 19, in 1944, 1945. He only converted in 1945, um, but that he'd always been devoted to Christ. On the other hand, uh, other people say that he was uh, maybe devoted to Christ, but also uh, when he, uh, when the when the uh, Nazis entered Rome, he went into hiding and did not support the Jewish community. There were other rabbis in Rome who held synagogue services, who supported the Jewish community. Rabbi Zoli went into hiding, and when he came out of hiding, um, and uh, he, he wanted his job back, and when they wouldn't give him his job back, he wanted his pension. Uh, and the the Jewish community said, "We're sorry." But were you, you know, we're not getting, you're no longer the chief rabbi of Rome. You weren't when the ships were down, you were not, and we're not giving you your pension. You can uh, how should the Jewish community respond to the prospect that Pope Pius XII could become a saint? Well, I think that the Jewish community must must respond with first of all, I don't know how I can speak for the Jewish community. You're right. I think that they I think that with understanding. Uh, this is not a person I would necessarily have elevated to sainthood, but I don't, wouldn't elevate anyone to sainthood. But the point is that uh, he was also a person who uh, presided over in Rome the uh, salvation of half of the Jewish population of Rome. He did not do, as far as we can say, one thing to make that happen. But churches, monasteries, convents saved thousands of Jews in Rome. And he knew about it. And he certainly didn't stop it. And if you ask, if you ask uh, a Monsignor, uh, a, a, 
uh, you know, a sister in the convent. We got our we got our instructions from the Pope. The Pope told us to save Jews. You ask them, where's the instruction to, to, to send you a letter? Nothing ever found. But they all believe that he did. And from their point of view, he should be uh, sanctified because he helped save Jews. I have the, the last question is are Italian Jews today concerned about the current rightward swing of the Italian government and the current prime minister who has said things that seem to be vocally anti-Semitic? Yes, they are concerned. And uh, the, my, my, the people who I speak to there have told me, frankly, they say that they don't believe that the, that the supporters of this right-wing government uh, that that they, the percentage of supporters that they seem to have in you know in the parliament or whatever it is represents the percentage of anti-Semites in Italy. They don't like the government. They don't like the rightward swing, but they don't do not believe yet. Now, things change. They do not believe that the government would have support among their own supporters for anti-Semitism, that's what they say. So there's reason to end on a note of cautious optimism and hope. A uh, little bit of uh, a little bit of problems with Italy's not recognizing during the Holocaust the special suffering of Jews and the Jews, the word Jew not being uttered and also a lack of assumption of responsibility, which was the first reaction of Germany after World War II, but Germany then embraced its history. Italy doesn't seem to have done that yet, but I sense from you a hope that there uh, may be on the way to a process of, of reconciling themselves uh, to their history, both their actions and their inactions. Yes, well, you should sense also that I'm about to write about that, because yeah, because indeed, what happened in Italy, which did not happen in Germany, was that a civil war broke out in Italy, uh, driving the fascists out, driving the Nazis out, but there were Italians who fought against the, uh, fought on the side of the, of the Nazis, and the side of the fascists, even though it was a Clearly a losing cause at that point, they still did. And that divided, we now have a divided memory in Italy, which is apparent in war memorials and in, 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 uh, in other places. And I am looking into it because I think it's a fascinating topic. I can't wait to read your new book when it comes <laughs> out. I thank you very much for Intimate Strangers. It was a wonderful read. And I thank you for your time and your uh, wit and your scholarship. And this has been a real pleasure. Uh, and um, I hope we're able to do it again with your new book. Well, yeah, that's the way it's always. And thank, you thank you very, very much. much. And uh, uh, feel free to find this uh, on AJU's Facebook page, where you will find this later today archived for mm -hmm. some time. And if your friends have missed it, uh, the Facebook is a good way to access all of our older programs. Uh, and with that, I thank you all for your attendance and goodbye. <laughs>